walked into today. Today is a formal assembly, so it is going to look a little different than our pep assembly. We expect that everyone is respectful of the speakers and the performances that you'll see today. We also ask that you're respectful of this time while we're here. I ask that if you have any urgent needs or emergencies that you quietly get up and exit the auditorium. But we also ask that you minimize disruptions if possible. I hope that everyone enjoys today's presentations and walks away with positive new insights and thoughts of how we can serve one another better every day. Welcome. We're ready to get started. definition of black resistance power to the people you're amazing you do all the things so what has this theme looked like over time and what does it look like today to you yeah i think a lot of what my work and our work largely is like so black my entity and stuff um a lot of what our work is is around like kind of myth busting in a way or reframing and so even before we kind of dig into that question itself and what black resistance the way i see it as uh, historically decades ago and today um as these we talk about it is, is important why are we talking about black resistance in the first place right what are we resisting against and i think it's important to name things right so we're resisting against in large part global white supremacy in different aspects uh, so i think when we talk about black history month and uh black history years as i call a lot of ways there's a lot of like uplifting and love and power and and things that are centering blackness uh as it should be and always should be but also there's a large part of that's like resisting against white supremacy in different facets and with white supremacy there's also capitalism patriarchy transphobia all the isms that come with that all the balances that come with that and so 
it's I won't say it's a two parts. I don't really believe in binaries, but I think we need to talk about all those things to be uh, in a holistic manner. Um, and so I think even with that question, it's like we 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 tend to traditionally name uh, civil rights heroes and folks that are always resisting against this these invisible apparatuses of violence and we don't name those things they tend to be pervasive and still exist today and we see lots of examples of that and so uh one thing i just would i guess like uh implore everyone to to think about it is is what what is what is not being said in conversations like this and how do we name those things very specific language um because we have that with that specific language allows us to challenge and uplift and and actually work towards something in a very tangible way in ways that may be very uncomfortable in the ways that may bring up other isms that uh black folks have white folks have beyond that as well and so i just want to like name that as a framing reference for the whole conversation um but to get to the crux of the question um i think you know black resistance you know I'm, when i was in high school we i was president of the black student union so we had like a you know, every year, Black History Month, we were always doing events and stuff. And so part of it was, what's the theme, the sub-theme this year? One of the themes was Black history is American history, which is very true. Uh, we can't talk about American history without including Black history and our contributions to this country. But also, even that's limited, right? This is, Black history is global, right? Uh, black people are everywhere. Contributions are everywhere. Um, but we tend to think of it as an American context. We live here, which makes sense in a lot of ways. We have to think about these things a lot bigger and more internationally um, than, than ever before. And so I think what it has looked like, I mean, we take it from transatlantic slave trade to folks jumping from ships they didn't want to be enslaved to Nat Turner's rebellion uh, during enslavement to Black power movements to uh, Black summer years ago to George Floyd 2020 uh, to now tons of movements happening at the same time. We tend to think of uh, those issues against cross institutions, typically in the, in the terms of policing prisons, that's it. And and really, we want to lean really into a black radical tradition. We're thinking of healthcare. We're thinking of um, um, education. We're thinking of all the things we know the research says and that our ancestors knew to take care of each other in community. Um, restorative justice, talking to each other, talking about our feelings. All those things are part of. Uh, a healthy ecosystem for everybody, but especially in like black radical traditions and black ancestral traditions, indigenous ancestral traditions, um, and really all of everyone's kind of history, but it shows up a lot uh, more so in the Afrocentric kind of studies and, and thought processes and frameworks. And so um, I think all that is resistance, even though it is very positive and it's without the other of the enemy. Um, I think there is a lot of like radical uh, movement and work and things we can name and we'll probably be named throughout the entire month anyway that we can point to that are important, but also these things that are um, centered around love and centered around Black people uh, and um, Indigenous traditions without even considering the other, considering the violence of the isms, I think is also important as well. So as we kind of start this conversation throughout the whole month, I think it's important to just take all that into consideration the whole time because it's going to be a lot to chew on for this month and hopefully for the rest of the When we say abolition, we're talking about creating new relationships between human beings. We want to provide energy and effort into community work, into transformative justice. Way to cut down on police interaction sources away from them and reinvest those resources in the community. And then we got a lot of work to do. We got a whole lot of work to do. We got seven generations of work to do. Take a step back and like, what do what do we need now as a society, as a globe, to actually do better in the world and create a world that we just prioritizes love? It sounds corny, it sounds cliche, but we're not doing it, and we can if we look to our ancestors. Yeah, I agree with that. I think you had mentioned earlier in the summer of 2020, um, it seemed like more, in my perspective anyway, it seemed like more people started asking that why, like, why did this happen? Um, how is it continuing to happen? <laughs> and is there something that we can do? Those were the things that rolled around in my head the most. Um, it was, Colin, I'm totally with you that it's been a really weird time, but I also am left even in the nastiness of it's a hopeful time because I think those conversations are happening. There's more and more people who are going, oh, wait, what? 
than have ever happened before, it seems like. And yeah. so that gives me hope that through this positivity and through this, through action, and to me, that's the message for students, uh, that there is change to be had, right? You're not trapped in the system. You can change the system because the system in the end is made of people and people can learn to be better. Yeah, it's all just people doing things. None of this stuff is permanent. It's all just people making decisions. Yeah. Um, and we can make other decisions. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let my people go. Let my people go. Set my people free. Let my people free. I'm letting my people know. I'm letting my people know. I love you like you and me. I love you like you and me. Love it in high school. I would like to introduce you to uh, storytelling visual artist Karen E. Griffin. Uh, a few years ago, on a field trip to Kansas City, we met Miss Griffin at the American Jazz Museum. And shortly thereafter, she was one of our uh, guests in person at the 2018 Culture Fair. And she has uh, been telling us stories and showing her art uh, ever since then. And so uh, here's um, an opportunity to introduce you to the whole school. Oh, thank you. So for starters, can everybody inhale for me? And exhale. Inhale again. And my question is, what is the problem? What literally is the problem? If we could all inhale and exhale the exact same air, can somebody please tell me what is the problem? As you, of course, you all know we just got done with COVID. It's still lingering out there. So, of course, we're inhaling and exhaling each other's air. COVID has no leaves or it has no bounds. It's just doing its thing and it's circulating and it's circulating our air. So if we're sharing each other's air again, what is the problem? Again, my name is Karen E. Griffin. E stands for excited, encourage, empower, elevate every day. That's what it stands for. So again, yes, my name is Karen E. Griffin. I am a textile and performing artist. I am a certified international storyteller. I am a certified, working on it, radio co-host. I am also a certified international program tour manager. Why I have all those titles? Because I've been given a gift and I'm honored to have that gift. My career started uh, September, 2020. And it really started before September, 2020. It started literally when I was seven years old. Seven years old, I had an opportunity to sit in my mother's lap. And I will never forget the day when my mother took my little brown hands and placed them on top of hers. And she said, just hold on. And when we got done sewing that first seam, I opened it up and I said, look, mama, this is art. And my mother, of course, said, no, baby, it's not art. We just sewed a seam. You see, I don't think my mother realized what she had gifted me and I had an opportunity to explore to create art. She wanted me to be a seamstress. I don't want to be a seamstress. I know I would have had my pants, legs backwards and a sleeve around my neck. That just was not my cup of tea. But I do know I have been given a gift to show a straight seam. You see, as a textile artist, I have a, ca a capability of taking fabric and creating a piece. These are visions that are just in my head. I do not know what the colors look like. I just know that I'm instructed to take seams and fabric and put them together to create art. Not only to create art, but also to create a story, create something that's engaging, creating something that's powerful. You see, because I found out people don't always want to hear what you're saying, but they'll engage and connect to what, whatever you express through art. People will stand around an art piece and everybody will have their opinion. And sometimes you don't even have to have a label to describe it. Some people just get it. And then there are some people that don't get it because they'll do like this. I don't get it. That's because that piece is not necessarily speaking to them or they don't have a connection with that piece and it's okay. But with my pieces, I have found out that I have been given the gift, again, to connect pieces to create a story. You see, I'm sewing scenes to tell stories. 
man, that's a wonderful gift. Again, it started in September, 2020, when my mentor, my coach had passed away, Mr. Ron Chaney. And I was instructed to go in my studio and shut the door and protect my oil for 21 days. I did not realize that 21 days was gonna to lead to three months. Three months led to me creating my very first solo exhibition at the Black Archives. And it was titled, Our Ancestors, Unfinished Stories in America on the Line. Please take note, I put America with a little A because as a woman of color, I am not accepted like everyone else is. I have to fight and pre-prove to everybody else that I'm just as good as the next person. So I have to keep stepping over leaps and boundaries to know. You see, they can look at my resume and be like, man, you're qualified. And then look at me and say, oh, the job's already been taken. I don't get it. So when I host my very first solo, it was over at the Black Archives, and I'll never forget the mayor's mom, Quincy Bennett, said, just go ask Dr. Carm if you can host your exhibit here. And I did. I didn't realize exactly what I was doing. All I knew is I was trying to complete my assignments in a timely manner. 21 pieces to be exact. One of the pieces in the exhibition was titled 1619, No Passport to America. That piece is 104 inches wide and 47 inches long. When I got done with that piece, I did not realize the capability what I had and what I was holding in my hands. As soon as I sewed on that last seam, I literally dropped to my knees in my studio and I thanked my ancestors for giving me a gift to be able to create something with art. See, art, as a lot of people may say, is a universal language. Arts and cultures are the exact same thing. The only difference is our native tongue. Of course, one of my favorite, as you can see right here on the right side of me, is Ida B. Wells Burnett. You see, my storytelling comes in after I create an art piece. So that means I have an ancestor that an artist, another one that's a storyteller. Let me tell you, that storyteller one, she's heavy. That girl over there don't play no punches at all. She makes sure that I stay on point for every single piece. You see, the piece of Ida B. Wells Burnett is one of my favorites. It is four pieces in the series, and it's titled, I Am Black, Cream, and Red. Black represents death. Cream represents the rope and the tree he does not want to be hung by. And the red represents his lifeline sinking into the soil. The other pieces in the collection, there's one that's called his mask. You see, when you took the Africans from their motherland, where they were given birth, they were given life, and you took them from the motherland, you literally took away his protection. You took away his shield of faith. You see, with Ida B. Wells, if I can just deliver one little piece from you from Ida B. Wells, and that's where I learned the difference at. You see, Ida had bought a ticket, quote unquote. I have bought a ticket so just so I could sit on the train. And of course, I wanted to sit next to the rest of the ladies. So I sat in the ladies' cart. Pullman Porter comes through and says, excuse me, my lady, may I see your ticket? Of course, I handed him my ticket. He handed it back. He says, excuse me, but I'm going to have to ask you to move to the smoking section. Excuse me, sir, but... I'd rather sit right here with the rest of the ladies. Ain't I a woman? Sure, John or true. Next thing I know, he places his hand up on my shoulder and tries to pull me up out of my seat. Well, of course, out of defense, I bit him on the back of his hand. Self-defense. You touch me, I'm going to bite you. I mean, I got to protect myself. I'm a lady. Next thing I know, another Pullman porter comes through and they're both wrestling and pulling with me and putting me off the train and everybody else on the train was cheering and roaring them on. Well, of course I was appalled and I was embarrassed. You see, I don't understand. How is it that green money can buy me anything I want, but because the color of my skin it stops me, it eliminates me from excelling and going to the next level like someone else. Again, 
if we can all inhale and exhale the exact same air. Why are we so ignorant and why are we so mad at each other in today's social society? A blind man can't see the moon come up and he can't see it go down. But we'll look at each other and we'll turn our nose up at each other before we take our hand out to help someone. You see, there are only two colors that really matter in art, in life. That's green money and red blood. That money and that blood brought us into life and it will take us out of life. And Ida B. Wells made it very clear. And I just wanna say from me to you, start sharing your heart because isn't art a part of your heart? Dreams. 
Everyone in this place should raise your hand, including myself. At 56 years old, I'm still dreaming. And I'm still pushing towards those dreams because it takes excellence in order for your dreams to be manifested. But I want to share with you, Lebanon High, if your dreams do not scare you, your dreams are not big enough. If your dreams do not keep you up at night, do not cause you to frantic sometimes, then your dreams are not big enough. What I see is someone in this audience is the, is the, is the person who's going to have a cure for cancer. Someone in this audience is going to cure hunger. And need I say, since it is Black History Month, someone in this audience is going to put an end to racism. That's how big your dream is. I want you to listen to me carefully, but I also want you to keep your eyes on me. I would appreciate it if you set up, take your feet off the seat that's in front of you, because the truth be told, when you think about that one person that, God, I wish I could meet them, I promise you, you would sit up straight, you would look at that person in awe, and you would soak in all of their wisdom. And I've met some uh, people like that, and I can assure you, when I was in their presence, nothing else mattered because I wanted to soak in all of their wisdom. I'm a big basketball fan, and I'm a huge LeBron James fan. We have the LeBron James fans here? Yeah. The new meaning story in the NBA? If LeBron James was standing right here, I guarantee you, you'd lose your mind and rush down here just to meet him, and so would I. So, I ask you to give me your undivided attention because what I want to share with you, I hope it permeates through your skin down to your soul. Because the truth be told, in this assembly, though there are many different races, though there are many different nationalities, if we cut ourselves, we would all bleed crimson red. And that makes us one family here at Lebanon High. Do you feel me? Some of you may have never heard of this singer, 
uh, but his name is Luther Vandross, and that's the man that I that I was that I wanted to be like. He's the man that I wanted to sing like. And so in 1985, I wrote his fan club just to ask him, how did you get started? Every Christmas, I would tell my mom, purchase me a Luther Vandross album. And I copied his style, the way he stood in front of a microphone and the way he sang. Six months later, I came home from college on a weekend, and my mother said, Todd, you got a letter. And of course, it was from his fan club. There was a 12-page biography in that letter, but what struck me the most is there was a 3 by 5 black and white photo. What struck me even more is on the back what he said, and that picture is in my office today. It's on my phone, so when I have those moments just like you, I get down, I cry, I want to give up, I don't want to pay attention, I want to quit. Luther said on the back of that picture, Todd, thank you for your kind-hearted words. It's people like you who make all the hard work worthwhile. I hope the enclosed biography answered all of your questions. All the best to you in your future endeavors. Remember, Todd, and I said to you, Lebanon, what Luther Vandal said to me, work hard and believe. Kindness regards, and he signed it, Luther Vandross. That picture is in my office, and that picture will stay with me. So, hear the words of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., because I believe it applies to all of us, since we all have dreams that are so big that it scares us. And in closing, I dedicate this to the memory in my hometown of Memphis, Tennessee, of Mr. Tyree Nichols. <clears throat> and so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream that's deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day, over the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips, dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day, right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. The rough places shall be made plain, and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope, and this is the faith that all flesh shall see it together. With this faith, <clears throat> we will be able to hear out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to swivel together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. Oh, this will be the day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with a new me. My country, tears of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrims 
strife from every mountainside. Let freedom reign. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so, let freedom reign from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom reign from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom reign from the hiking Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom reign from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom reign from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom reign from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom reign from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom reign from every hill and molehill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom reign. And when this happens, when we allow freedom reign, when we let it reign from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men, white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last. Oh, thank God Almighty, we're free at last. Thank you.
and currently the Director of Selective Service for the State of Missouri.
this poem because I believe it applies to everybody in life. Even today, this life. We all have struggles. We all are going to reach and experience challenges in our life. But it's important that you, it's important that we persevere, keep going, even when we are faced with obstacles. Obstacles such as sickness, depression, natural disasters, failing a test, not doing well in class, no matter what those disasters or challenges are. Just remember, never give up.